Welcome to World of DAS, a show for data enthusiasts. I'm your host, Warren Hoffman, CEO of SafeGraph and GP of Flex Capital. For more conversations, videos, and transcripts, visit safegraph.com slash podcast. Hello, fellow data nerds. My guest today is Marissa Meyer. Marissa was the CEO of Yahoo and the 20th employee of Google, where she held key leadership roles in Google Search, Maps, and Gmail, among other things. She's currently the co-founder and CEO of Sunshine. Marissa, welcome to World of DAS. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. Thanks, Juan. I'm really excited. Now, you spent a decade at Google, um, and both of your degrees are in AI. Google has like an amazing AI program. How, do you think they made a mistake by not releasing Bard earlier and kind of giving an opening to open AI? Or where do you where do you like think of them in the kind of the AI landscape? Yeah, I think that they, um, by and large, have so much of the AI talent that they've got a huge lead overall in terms of what they can do. I think they have been a little bit slow to release some of the early demonstrations like Bard, um, but I, I think you can far from count them out. I think that they, they're they clearly going to be big players in AI and what happens with you know different chat technologies as well as different search technologies and how AI influences all of those. Um, so I think that they have had a slower start for whatever reason, but I uh, I think that we're going to see a lot of developments. If you think of like on the one hand, these big companies, they have like this massive talent. Um, they have a lot, you know, they have all this like incredible um, IP going for them. Um, they have a ton of money, which you need for AI because you need a lot of compute. Um, but on the, on the other side, like they're, they're going to be slightly risk averse because AI could say something like really dumb or stupid or, um, you know, say something bad. So how do you think that kind of balances with when you think some of these larger companies versus things that are more of a startup? Well, I think it's interesting. I think that both had their advantages in the space overall, though I would probably, because of the cost basis being so high, lean towards some of the larger competitors having um, having advantages. Uh, that said, I have a feeling the risk aversion probably doesn't come in terms of the technology saying something stupid. I think that in the world of AI, we know that it's going to have time for it seems really intelligent. There's going to be times, just like people, where it makes mistakes. And early in this evolution, it's going to make more mistakes rather than less. Uh, and so I think, you know, people will be by and large understanding about that. Google's pretty good at taking risks on those types of things. I think the bigger issue is overall what happens to the business model and the revenue model, that of course, is generating all that capital that they're building on. And I think that is really where some of the risk aversion um, issues get more interesting. What happens with search ads when you're talking to an AI agent or chatting with an AI agent, right? So I think that's really what can cause people to move more slowly um, because you have to be protective in some ways of that business model or at least have a plan for how it evolves. Now, where do you think like the evolution of the software engineer is going I, I had I've, I've gotten back into software engineering after a long time hiatus, and it's so much better now than it used to be because all the all the things I used to hate about software engineering, the drudgery, like the looking for all the misplaced semicolons, like all that stuff now is is maybe not one hundred percent automated away, but it's like eighty percent automated away. And I could spend a lot more time on the creativity. How do you think that's going to? enable more innovation in the future? Yeah, I think in terms of co-programming, um, I find I'm hearing from a lot of different software engineers that they really enjoy having you know, Chad GPT be their co-programmer. Uh, and I saw even just over the weekend, some of my former colleagues were commenting that it's like God's gift to unit tests. Right? No one wants to sit around <laughs> and write unit tests, but you could ask yeah. Chad GPT to write a bunch of unit tests for you. And once you got the framework up and running, like just, you know, giving verbal commands that basically could add more unit tests is is really fast and easy. So, you know, I think that we'll, we'll see some of, the, some of the drudgery even kind of move higher up the stack, right? Where you've like- Okay, so not like only is it going to be easier tools. to write code, but easier to like QA your code and everything. Exactly. So like some of the things where you might be like, oh, that's so hard, or I don't want to take the time to build a, a testing framework. You know, if that becomes a lot easier, you're going to see- you will do that more. So I think basically it, it starts to make coding even more efficient um, and and probably increases productivity a lot. 
from a do you, do you think it also could help with like documentation not, not only like writing the docs but also interpreting the code for other people to help them understand it faster that i'm less sure about i think that some of the hardest code is you know you know if you if it ends up being too formulaic of a of a description i think it does it's not useful i mean I haven't coded in a long time, but you know, but I think back, even if I just the coding I do dabble on, on the side, um, you know, sometimes the most interesting, the things you need the comments on the most are the hardest to understand pieces of code. Yep. And they're good, often good the hardest to describe. And you really want the original authors, like when you wrote this, how did you think about your approach in terms of how you unpacked the problem and how you structured this? And for that, you really need. I think the, the train of thought, you don't just want someone analyzing the code because even if you know, some of the best programmers in the world come and look at the code later, their analysis isn't quite with the same effect that the original programmer would have done. And where, where do you think AI so is going to have I think maybe... I guess in short, you can get a lot more documentation yeah. easily, obviously, because it can generate them, it generate it, but the most useful documentation, I think, still has to be done by the person by who's, who, who did it, which if it's... If it is, in fact, ChatGPT that wrote it in the first place, it can document it well. Where, where do you where do you think AI is going to have the most like non obvious impact in the next few years? Well, I think that right now what we're seeing with generative AI is kind of by and large, it's where the big breakthroughs happen. And to me, that was counterintuitive. So we spend so much time worried about like how do people, you know, my whole degree was in. You know, how do people reason? How do they think? How do they express themselves? And a lot of it focused from AI went into how do you reason? How do you express yourself? What's the logic? How do we get that logic captured of what people are thinking and, and tag it in data and teach a, a computer to make the same judgments? And I think what's fascinating is, is actually being the expression that we see this really big burst of ev evolution, right? As, you know, small systems was, you know, uh, psychology, how do you learn? Philosophy, how do you reason? Linguistics, how do you express yourself? And computer science, can you make a computer do the same? And it's kind of interesting because, like, I was I wouldn't wasn't expecting a lot of it to come in the expression, right? That once you've got the the learning and the logic in place, what you can actually do is really explode the expression of it, whether it's Dolly or ChatGPT. So I think we're going to see a huge surge there in lots of forms of expression. And I think that's where a lot of the, the big unlocks are going to happen. Uh, and I think that will feed into some of the the, the learning and the, the logic pieces. But I think that, that it's been a hard, it, I don't think this is it. I think this is a harbinger of what's coming. I, I, I was personally extremely taken by surprise by the fact that the creativity side of AI has progressed so much over the next few years. Um, is that uh, is that something you, like a few years ago you were not expecting as well? Exactly. I thought it would come in reasoning. You know, it can diagnose yeah. illnesses better. It can find breast cancer better. Right? Like it, when you look at all the different things that people were building in AI, a lot of it was basically coming to conclusions faster, making better judgments, all of those types of things. And so a lot of the focus was going into the logic, the reasoning, the training data, the modeling. And so to have this suddenly, this, it, it translates this big explosion in terms of what it can express and what it can create, the generative piece of AI um, was, it was a surprise. I mean, it's obvious now in hindsight, perhaps, but it, 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 was, a, it was a surprise for sure uh, to see how quickly it evolved. When I look at these, like some of these generative AI, um, like a mid journey, this is a very, very, very small team of a you know small number of people with not a ton of money, um, making like an incredible product. Maybe it's somewhat hacky because they're using Discord and it, you know the UI is not great and stuff like that. But like people are are it has such amazing product market fit and it's so fun. Um, I find like more of my entertainment is going to places like Mid Journey than it is to like Netflix and stuff. Like, how do you see that in people's affecting people's lives? Well, I think that it, I think that it speaks for itself. The type of adoption, the type of you know public imagination is captured is phenomenal. It's what happens when you have great product market fit. Uh, and you know, I think there's a huge credit that goes to the open AI team. Um, and to hear, I, I was lucky to hear a, a, an interview um, from Sam about how they approached it. And if you think about it, they worked on it for a really long time. 
right? Like, yeah. you know, five years before the first release, seven years before Chat GPT came out. Um, and he's like, and they, they took an approach that was quite controversial in the industry and, and you know, and, and counterintuitive in terms of how to approach the building of, of the AI. But they had a thesis and had a lot of conviction around it. Um, so it's a small group of people, but I, you know, I, it, they, they really got it right. Now, um, you were hired at Yahoo. You were kind of a turnaround CEO. And I love the anecdotes from the time. You had these like PB&J for <laughs> cutting process, bureaucracy, and jams. Um, you cut red tape. Now, there's a lot of people right now who are kind of running that playbook today to try to make organizations more efficient. What are some of your takeaways from that experience that you would that people could learn from today? Uh, yeah, so when I got to Yahoo, there were all of these kind of funny processes that had grown up over time, right? Like one of the top engineers in the company came and gave me like a 17 page presentation about what he wanted to build. And, and it's kind of funny because I had grown up at Google, so I was only used to Google processes. And then at the end, there's a last slide and it was like, I need three engineers. <laughs> and I was like, you're like one of the top engineers in the company. Like, if you need three engineers, just like draft them and put them on this project. This is like a super important project that makes all the sense in the world and you're really passionate about. And he was like, well, the, the CFO says I can't. <laughs> <How about that? laughs> he was like, I was like, oh, like something's wrong with this, right? Where I was like, okay. Um, you know, what I was finding was that there were a ton of very talented people who knew what they wanted to do. And some of it was really fundamental in terms of just like resource allocation, capital allocation. Uh, and those you might have to do a little bit more process around just to have good stewardship. But there were also like silly things. Like it happened to be summer when I started. It was mid-July. There was a company picnic the next week. And like everyone, um, they sent an email saying like the, the summer picnic's next, next week. Um, they had set up, it was kind of awesome. They set up a zip line from the top of the parking garage to town. Oh, that's and, cool. And like, and then they attached a waiver that everyone had to print out and sign and bring to the picnic. <laughs> and like everyone <laughs> I talked to in HR was like, I know it's terrible the rabbi people print this out, but we couldn't figure out how to get them to sign it otherwise. And like, so we're like, we're, you know, we're killing a ton of trees, but there's also just like, like also like the fun of just like, hey, go go down to the picnic and enjoy the day, right? You're like, everyone's getting their <laughs> waiver. And, and like everyone's like, they, they kind of knew it was wrong, but they needed permission to just be like, no, it's just too much bureaucracy. Right, like we let's just figure an easier way and get the zipline waiver done. Like just little silly things like that. Where, in all honesty, the CEO shouldn't have to get involved. Which is why I was like, you know what, I'm going to set up process bureaucracy and jams so people can fix these problems for themselves and just say, you know what, this is too sticky. It's just there's just too much bureaucracy here for what it is, and and figure out how to streamline those those processes. So it was album because like I mean within arriving at Yahoo within the first month, there were hundreds of examples like that, um, where, you know, you just needed someone to feel like they were in charge enough to make the decision to do it. In fact, I, I'm known for working late. I got there, I worked very really late the first few nights. And um, my admin and I were still there. And all of a sudden, it's at seven o'clock at night, like, whoops, like the entire building went dark. <laughs> <laughs> and we were running around like waving our arms like trying to turn on the lights and like couldn't turn the lights back on and it turned out like the decision had been made that like from 7 p.m until 7 a.m like the lights were off I was like, like <laughs> I mean I mean in the engineering culture where like people like to work late code late into the night right like and if you've got somebody who wants to do that like absolutely not to do that and like, I remember like after we finally found the master switch for our floor and got the lights turned back on that first night like Trish was, I was like, Trish, we got to figure out how to keep these lights on. <laughs> and, like, and, and, and she was like, how can I do that? And I was like, you can do it. And so I was like, by the next day she fixes. So sometimes it's just a matter of telling people and empowering them and saying, you know, you can make the decision to make this change, to keep the lights on until midnight or whenever it is. Um, and, and they know what to do. Sometimes it's just that they don't feel like they have the authority to do it. And that's what PB&J was really about, was a, uh, empowering everyone that you do have the if you see something that's wrong, that's broken, that just doesn't make any sense, why are the lights going off at seven? Why is there an, a printable waiver for the zip line? Whatever it is, if there's something that just doesn't make sense, change it. One of the things that happens at these big companies is 
they become so big that they they don't trust the judgment of the average employee. So they put all these rules around that employee so they don't have to trust the judgment. Um, it's like, it, and it makes sense in the military, you have to, any able-bodied 18-year-old has to join and maybe the average 18-year-old doesn't have good judgment and they're around guns and stuff like that. So, okay, it makes sense. Let's have a whole bunch of rules. But they kind of apply that same thing to to even a company like Yahoo. How do we guard against some of those things? I, I think that I saw it happen at Google. I saw it happen at Yahoo. You know, pure process and rules and these types of guidelines do build up over time. And then you have to break the neck down. For a long time, I ran a process at Google around launching products. It was called the launch calendar. And in the beginning, it was just because like we needed to get PR and marketing and legal and privacy and a whole bunch of different groups all looking at a product before it went out the door. So it started off yep. with five checks, right? You just had to mail a person in each of those departments who is your partner and saying, hey, do you know that this is coming out on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, when I it was coming out? And it was checks. And then suddenly there were suddenly subcategories of checks and subcategories of subcategories. And like <laughs> before I knew it, I turned around at one point, there were like 63 questions you had to answer just to even launch like a simple feature or a very simple, you know, beta product. And then you're just like, okay, cut that back. Like what has to be there, right? Because, you know, to your point, like something goes wrong and then people say, oh, let's add in these checks. Uh, something goes wrong, let's add in these checks. And, you know, over the time I was at Google, we had to basically redo the launch process, I think three different times. You know, three different times we had to say like, the launch process is broken, which is painful because, you know, it's a process that you've learned. It, you know, to use and it works. But when you get that next order of magnitude, it doesn't work anymore. So now you have to reinvent it and actually go back and say, what makes sense now? And also how can we be as fast and nimble and, and again, have it be as sensible as possible. So I think that it is just a matter of just constantly reevaluating. Does this make sense? Which, you know, to that end, fresh talent coming into the company is helpful because it has fresh eyes where you're just like, you know, we may have signed the waiver for the picnic for the last five years, but either we should do this online or not do it or just do it when they get on the zip line or whatever else makes sense. But sometimes it takes someone with fresh eyes saying, I know we've been doing it this way, but let's not. In, in HR, it does seem like these things come in even faster than maybe some others. I once joined a company and I, I decided to read the whole HR handbook, which was like super long. And even it even had something on there where it said you cannot do cocaine on premises. It didn't say meth or heroin, but it like specifically called <laughs> out cocaine. And like it turned out like I called the HR person or and the, there was some story about some guy who did like cocaine in the bathroom at some point. So they felt like it was important to put it in the manual. Um, and you know, I could see how these things just keep going. Every time somebody has an infraction, they add it to the manual there. Like, how do you guard against that? Well, again, I I don't know that you really can. I just think you have to do a revision every now and then to say like, wait, is there something that's overly specific or misses something or doesn't belong here yeah. but belongs somewhere else? You, know, you have to have, you know, kind of stewards of these process, processes. And the problem is sometimes when someone becomes a steward of the process, they become kind of the protector of that process. It's so good. It shouldn't be revisited. It shouldn't be revised. Yeah. And you have to say, actually, like, it's kind of got to the point where it's not making sense anymore. And we and we do need to revise it. And so you need to have, if I, I find you need to have somebody who really feels ownership of it and also some humility around it that over time it's going to evolve in a way that doesn't make sense because of all the forces uh, trying, you know, to create a protective culture around, you know, around the company and around some of, the, of what has to happen. Um and it's not your fault that it doesn't make sense. It doesn't look bad on you, but you do have to go through it and actually make it make sense again. Now, you were Yahoo's, I think, seventh CEO in five years when you were hired. What, what does a good CEO transition look like? Um, in all honesty, I don't. I mean, one, it would be great if there was actually a transition from <laughs> one CEO to another CEO, because when I got there, there is an interim CEO. So I actually didn't have the benefit in the context of the job, you know, the specific formal context of the job of actually having transition time with my predecessor. That said, I did seek out, and I think I spoke with every former Yahoo CEO in my first 30 days, with the exception of Tim Kugel, who, who had been you know, gone for at least 15 years, and I, I wasn't able to track him down in that same time frame. And I have to say, every single, every single one of the former CEOs was incredibly helpful to me. Um, they all had insights uh, from their time there, what worked, what didn't. 
Um, and they were all really kind and generous with their time to sit down and talk with me about about what they saw as the you know as the as the assets uh, of the place and and different things and what they had seen work. Um, you know Terry Semmel, who really you know led you know who in his heyday had so yeah. many good insights in terms of just everything from you know the 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 right size of the board. Um, and you know how some of the leadership changes and evolution of different departments had worked and hadn't worked, and I was just incredibly, incredibly helpful. So I think actually, you know, having a relationship between the former CEO and the current CEO is extremely helpful because I think a lot of times when a company needs is continuity. That said, in a turnaround, sometimes you actually don't want continuity, um, yeah. right? So for obvious reasons, and so. Um, but you know, I was also involved in the transition at Walmart um, from Mike Duke uh, to Doug McMillan, and you know, there you see, like there, there's a it was a very seamless transition process. The transition was planned for more, you know, I would say so at least four months, probably closer to a year from start to finish, and and it was a very smooth process overall. So you have to look at the state of the company in terms of what kind of transition it needs. Does it need one? It's going to cause more for you know call for more reexamination, or is it one where there's things are already operationally good and you might be looking for some change, but it's a different kind of of change and optimization from the current starting point. So, and I do think that that dialogue among executives during a transition is incredibly important. I don't know how I would have done around the first you know for first few months or at least the first year without. A little bit of a roadmap from Terry Carroll, Jerry Yang, right? Um, that was that was incredibly helpful. And I will also say the very senior, long time employees that have been there for a long time um, uh, were are really helpful as well. So the fact that David Bilem had been there since the day it was founded and was still there when I got there, you know, he was like my Rosetta Stone to Yahoo. Like, why is this the business? Who made this decision? When did it happen? Right? Like, is it worth revisiting or is it not something that's you know, substan- substantive? Uh, he was incredibly helpful. And I also pulled together a list of, I think it was at the time, almost like 15 or 17 year Yahoos. So I pulled it, I pulled together anybody who was in the company for like more than 10 years and we would have town halls with just them because they had been oh, on this amazing ride, right? They yeah. had been there in like 2002. When you know Yahoo was the biggest internet company in the world, so they and they were you know incredibly well qualified coming in the door. So they were some of the sought after jobs in the industry. They had been on this amazing ride, and then they had of course been in, in a few years of decline, and they just had a huge amount of perspectives so like what worked here or what didn't work here, or right like what they would try. Um, and I was actually surprised because some of the more short term CEOs that came in the middle um, hadn't bothered to go to them as a resource. So mm. actually, one of the most interesting sentiments that came up in that whole process were they were like, "You want to talk to us?" So I was like, "Yeah," because like you have some really interesting ideas and perspectives, and like, you know, no one's ever wanted to talk to us before, right? Like we do, interesting. We do have, maybe we do have something to to say. And I was like, "Well, look, like <laughs> fixing Yahoo is going to be a really hard problem because if it was easy, someone would have done it a while ago." So like we all have to put our heads together in terms of what works and what doesn't, and try to put together a plan. Now, you mentioned Walmart. You've been on the board of Walmart for over a decade. They've been really incredible. If you look at most of their competitors, most have been like really disrupted. Many of them have gone bankrupt. Um, they're still thriving. Like, How do you advise them to be the disruptor and not the one disrupted? Um, Walmart is just an extraordinary uh, organization, and the team there is just incredible. And we generally have a policy that as board members, we don't, you know, the operators in the company are the ones who are making that happen. And so I don't want to ultimately speak for them. But I think that, you know, it has been an area, e-commerce in general has been a huge area of disruption. And I think that, you know, they've been very thoughtful about how do you keep the large business running and running well? And how do you use the natural strategic advantages that can be drawn from the physical presence that Walmart by definition has and use that as an advantage, right? One of the bigger uh, wins they've had over the years, which is just, it's just a phenomenal product and service is um, home grocery uh, shopping. So where you basically, you order online, you drive up and you, and you, um, and you pick up your groceries at the store. Uh, yeah. And, you know, I have to say when we first started seeing 
It was an idea that largely came from one of their acquisitions, Alistair in the UK. They tried it out in the US and the net promoter scores were like in the 90s. Like I was like, I've, wow. I've, never, I've never even seen NPS as look like this. Uh, so the question is, how do we scale it as fast as humanly possible? And like the operational execution at Walmart is is exceptional at things like that. So they managed to scale it to a large number of the stores quickly. And, you know, that was something that a lot of the competitors in the e-commerce space couldn't do is because it blended, you know, it did what they call omni-channel. It blended the e-commerce piece with the stores piece really well. And honestly, you know, then when COVID happened, everyone had to have their like yeah. pick up in store auction ready. And, and Walmart already did for groceries, which is what people needed the most, uh, which was, you know, incredibly, incredibly advantageous for them. Yeah, I mean, it is. It's it. Can, Walmart continues to amaze me because they. It, it seems like every ten years the company reinvents itself, and in this world today, where you know the the S and P five hundred looks very different today than it did twenty years ago, that is a real rarity. Yeah, and there's. I mean, they're still the, the Fortune one, right? Biggest company in the world in terms of revenue yep. and employee count. As I said, it's been it's been just fascinating to be a part of the board and and see that. Uh, and see that evolution. And I think that you know they've been in the winning position for a long time. One of the things I think about is, you know, the will- winner mindset and the challenger mindset. Um, and I think the danger when you're Walmart is that you get into the winner mindset. You're so used to being in the lead for so long that you don't see some of the challenges coming. But they have a real ability to wheel the paths and 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 understand when do they need to you know, adopt that challenger mindset and be more disruptive and take more risk. Uh, and and try things out, but it's it it really does, you know. I, it's funny because the, the company today it looks and feels so different than it did in 2012 when I joined the board. Yep. Now, one of the things you're really known for is developing talent. You created the APM program at Google. There's a lot of well-known people that you've mentored that have gone on to be CEOs and founders. What are some non-obvious things about developing talent? Um, that's a good question. I mean, I think I've. I, 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 because you, I run it in kind of a program manage, like mentality. Sometimes it's hard to be like, these are the tenants of it. Yeah. Um, but I think that, you know, the basic premise of the APM program was, you know, the way it started is it started with a bet with my boss. So there were three product managers at Google. Susan Wojcicki was in charge of partners. Um, and Saul or Kamigar was in charge of advertisers and I was in charge of most things consumers. Yep. And so we hired uh, our boss, Jonathan Rosenberg, uh, who I love, uh, is, he showed up and his job was to hire product managers. They were like, look, let Susan, Saul, and Marissa run the product vision, but you should hire, uh, we need to hire our product managers and the teams of, of product managers to work with. So, um, and in the first four months, Jonathan hired two people. Um, and at the same time, engineering hired uh, 64 in the same eight weeks. Oh, got it. So, we so were the, like, the ratio so we're, is so getting like, out so of we're, whack. So we're, so, we're, <laughs> so, we're, so we're growing in a way that's like 32 to 1. Right. Right, where you'd normally want to be like maybe 10 to 1. And then even worse, like he was like, well, Marissa, your division doesn't make any money because you're consumer. Like they don't pay us. The advertisers and the partners pay us. <laughs> and I was like, but wait, like if we didn't have any users using search, like we wouldn't have any advertisers, right? Like, like QED, like I need some help here because I was like managing like, I don't know, like 10 little products and, 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 and features, but it was, it was basically, you know, the lion's share of the work that was happening at the company in terms of the servers and, and, and the services that we offered. And then I said in my one-on-one, he was like, I'm sorry, but I'm just going to keep assigning these new product managers to revenue generating lives. And I couldn't kind of get through as to why the consumer piece was a big part of that. <laughs> um, you know, Jonathan kind of like chuckles about it now. I was like, I just, I want to bet. And then he was like, what's the bet? And I was like, I want to bet that I can grow new product managers that work out better at Google faster than you can hire senior ones uh, and experienced ones into the company. And he was like, okay, I'll take that bet, but what are you going to do? And I was like, don't worry about it. <laughs> and he's like, no, seriously, like, I am the VP of product management. You have to tell me, like, what are you going to do? I was like, okay, I'm just going to go to the best computer science programs in the country. I'm going to hire, I'm going to screen for application sense. How well do they really understand how technology can be applied? And then I'm going to put, bring them here. I'm going to put them in really big roles. 
that are probably bigger than people would put new grads in. So the time no one's putting new grads into product management. And then I'm going to try and emulate the experience that Susan was more experienced than us, but then the Saller and I had, which is you know, we had really big jobs and there were high expectations, and we got a lot of feedback. I, I, for, I categorize, I, you know, I, I um, we characterize it as a lot of yelling by Larry and Sergey, but, <laughs> um, but you know, but, but they gave us a lot of feedback on what we were doing well and what we weren't doing well, and so I was like, well, I'm just going to try and replicate that. So. We, you know, that was, I think that the insights from at least the founding of the APM program were hiring people based on, you know, overall sensibilities and intuition, less on experience, really pushing people, right? You know, one of um, the, the former CEOs of Walmart, Lee Scott, once told me, he's like, I've, he's like, I made a decision early in my career to never feel bad if I over promoted someone. Right, because he's like, if you overpromote yep. someone and they meet the challenge, you did a great thing. And he's like, and if they don't, like, no, like that's of all the mistakes you can make, overpromotion is is one of the less bad ones. And so, you know, by putting someone in a big role, you really test them, and a lot of times they can surprise you and and grow to meet the need. And so, um, I think that was a key, uh, uh, you know, piece. And then I also think, you know, feedback and feedback can be kind and gentle, but can also be rough. And I think. People are actually more responsive to feedback um, and, you know, we at, and coaching than than is, is obvious. We also hired in management coaches, just one hour a week for each APM, where they got to sit down and talk with a management coach about like how things were going. And I think that was, you know, part of the, even the secret sauce of the APM program because you know we had these kind of really stressed out new college grads and these really big jobs at one point like <laughs> you know i was like wow like i had this product program of like 30 of them I was like these are like the most stressed out 23 year olds on the planet like, so all like running like a billion dollars of revenue or a billion users <laughs> like and um but they would sit down and talk to someone about like how things were going you know did they have a sticky issue with their tech lead did they not know how to interpret this piece of user feedback and it was funny because by having that go to a management coach rather than their manager a lot of times they would get a lot more candid, and yeah. they would, you know, because you're you're when you're talking to your manager, you're like, what if they don't think what I'm saying is smart, or they feel like I'm not capable of dealing with this? But giving them that extra space to really explore some of what was getting in their way made them that much more agile at getting three things. Um, and you know, the, the, all of those people were incredible, and they were incredible before they ever showed up at at Google. But I how I'm did so you proud like? But how, how did you they, how so did you I, how ID done. them? Like I remember. I mean, you and I go back a long time. I remember over 15 years ago, you introduced me to Jeannie Kim. She was like a, you know, maybe a Daddy. new APM. Um, and she was just like this incredibly talented dynamo. She still is today. No, I know. But like, like, they're amazing. How did you, I mean, like, how you, did you about find those Ra people? Ryan Rakowski, my first, the, the first hire is still running Android and Chrome. I saw Brett Taylor last night who did Google Maps and was CTO of yep. Facebook and then CEO of, of sale or co-CEO of Salesforce. They've gone on to do, you know, overall just incredible things. Wesley Chan, who was like the second hire into the program, is now an incredibly big name in, you know, these in the in the venture capital world. And so, you know, they've gone on in different dimensions. But I looked for people who were incredibly smart, good students, really diligent, and I talked to them a lot about, you know, what you know. I, and I would think about the questions I would ask in those early days because I can even remember some of the answers from some of the really incredible uh, associate product manager hires we had. I would ask them, what's the coolest thing you've seen lately and what do you think it means for the next six months or a year? And one of my oh, favorite hires yeah. ever like talked about that because she had just been um, to a conference where they were taking nanotechnology and 3D printing organs. So there's, she's like, yeah, may completely revolution. If it works, it may completely revolutionize organ transplant. So I was like, that's <laughs> fascinating and amazing. They were printing it into like jellies and in, in like a three dimension, and like in the end, they have a perfectly sized and matched organ for you. Um, you know, so some of these ideas were just were just huge. And I also talk about like, you know, what's the thing you've built that you're proud of, most proud of, and why? And you know, the end, they would break down, you know. I was like, it could be academic, it could be an organization, it could be something physical. And I was still remember one of the best answers I ever got was a, a, a guy who 
had studied how you make surfboards and had made his own surfboard with like the seven layers or 15 layers or however much it is. And like, <laughs> and I, what I loved about that question was it, you know, I always say like, I'm a geek and I don't think it's a bad thing. To me, a geek is someone where all the details matter. Right. And so like somebody who's like, I'm going to study everything about the surfboard. And that's one of the things I love about you. It's like, you're just like, when you get interested in something, you're like, I'm going to study everything about it and, and really understand <laughs> it and be able to do it. And even though it's not, it doesn't make sense to make your own surfboard, maybe like the fact that you would know enough to do it is, is huge. And I also would ask them a lot about what's your favorite thing that you own and what is it that makes you love it so much, like a physical uh, thing. Okay. And so, so if you actually start to hear their, you start to hear their sensibilities about products, you start to hear how they can see around the corner a new piece of technology like someone would be like oh like you know if you have a webcam that costs under a hundred dollars you can start using them in pairs so you've got stereo vision and things like that and then you know like insights like that where you're like that's actually a really good answer because it does show where where things are going and some of these examples are now somewhat dated but th those types that was how i really identified them um, this, you know, we, we would interview them. We wanted them to be technically excellent. Every APM we hired, we said, needed to meet the standards of a Google engineer. So they showed that someone who could have been hired into engineering, but their product and technology sensibilities were just such that they could also help us design and build products. And then some product uh, questions that weren't necessarily even that aimed at Google and the technology specifically, but really tried to understand overall their sensibilities. Now, your company, Sunshine, is aiming to remake contacts. What does a better contact system look like in the well, future? Well, what we're actually trying to do, and it's funny because I think you, I saw you tweeted a while ago, you're like, I'm not sure I want this anymore. What we're actually trying to build is basically a personal relationship manager. Who okay. do you know? How do you know them? And actually making that available in a way that is, is you know, usually generally easy for companies who have CRMs. Find all yeah. your customers in Atlanta and you get and round them all up. But it's actually really hard for people. You know, invite everyone that your child's been in school with or in, in an after school activity with in the last two years in a candidate list for the birthday party. Right. Yeah. Uh, or you know, do my holiday hey, cards or there's, something. There's, or... there's great snow this weekend. Like find, you know, you're willing to go skiing with anyone you've skied with in the last 10 years if they're free this weekend. At which point time you need to know who have I gone skiing with in the past? Who do I know? And, you know, what does their calendar look like? Are they free? Those types of things. And so that's what we want to build eventually. And what we're starting with is contacts. Because as we started realizing, we were like, okay, if we're interested in events, or if we're interested in groups, or if we're interested in calendaring, all roads lead back to who are you calendaring? Who are you in a group with? Who are you in an event yep. with? And we are like, and, you know, one of the things is where we feel like technology falls short right now is how do people know each other, right? Because a lot of the social technology it's just as simple as everyone's a friend, everyone's a follower. It's very one dimensional as opposed to saying, this person's my mom. This person is a yeah. colleague who started yesterday. I'm willing to share and spend a different time and amount of and share a different amount of information in, in very different ways given those two different relationships. And so that's really what we're we're working to, to understand. And we, we're starting with contacts because it's an obvious foundational piece that you need. And I will say contacts in and of themselves are a mess. They're very, I know you've done some work on them too. They're incredibly messy. It's this common problem hidden in, in plain sight, right? Where everyone in the world who has a, has a smartphone has contacts on it. So there's an app yep. that comes built in. You talk to people and I joke, but sometimes like in user studies, I feel I have a friend who's a dermatologist and she said like sometimes the hardest part of her job is getting someone to show you the rash because they're embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> and I find like in contacts, like everyone has a rash. Right. You're like, they like, I'm like, they're like, oh, I've got a lot of first names only. I've got a lot of like last names as companies. I've got misspellings. <laughs> like, and then like they tell me all about all the problems. I'll be like, look, can I, can I see it? Just kind of take a quick look at it. And they'll be like, do you need to? <laughs> <laughs> like, everyone's like, it, I mean, it's so bad that people are really self conscious about it. And uh, we've worked on it really hard for a long time. And we're on our second version now. Our first version was good, but had some obvious issues. And, we're happy with where the second version is now. It's been serving users really well. I think it's the best contact solution out there and we're, and we're proud of it. And it can always be better. But when you look at p the duplicates for people, the partial information, also one of the fascinating facts we're finding is about 18 to 20% of your address book right now, yeah, if you aren't using a system like Sunshine Contacts that tries to update them, is stale. 
Like if you yeah. use that email right now or if you use that phone number, you would not reach the person that you are trying to reach. Um, so you're walking around with that person in your phone and that contact just isn't good anymore. Um, and so, you know, trying to come up with a way to to fix that, to maintain a person's current contacts, you know, it's easy to just say, hey, let's go from scratch and add great contacts. That's easy. But to say, hey, the person already's got 3,000 contacts, organize it and fix yeah. it and pull in from email and her signatures. Um, there's a, just a lot that can be done there to really make contacts great. And if you have great, well-organized contacts, it's life-changing. Like I was emailing back and forth to someone the other day and I was like, you know what, this, we can't keep doing this on email. Like we have to talk. And I went to call them. And I was like, how are they already my phone? And I was like, oh, right. Because I've got my Gmail hooked up to Sunshine Contacts. We're parsing. She's got a well-formed signature. Like, is it my contacts and is and it's synced onto my phone and like there you go and so like it's almost like having an automated assistant the whole time just keeping your role you know in the olden days your role of completely up to date um but there's there's a lot of problems in context it's, a, it's this thorny tricky problem that's proved harder than we thought but we like it um and uh and there's a lot of, of obvious ways to make it better 20 years ago my favorite application by more than anything was Plaxo, yeah, uh, which updated my contacts and did all th these incredible things. Like, was it just like too ahead of its time? Uh, or why so. did Plaxo become super successful? I think so. I, it's funny because along the way, as I've been working on Sunshine, I have become like a historian on contacts. So there was the kind of the era from 2000 to 2003 of Plaxo and there was another company called Keen. And I've gone back and talked to some of the people who worked on them. And like, once you, once you've gotten in to the, once you've worked on contacts, like, you know, it's just in your blood, just like search will always be in my blood. Now contacts will <laughs> always be in my blood. And like, you're always interested. You're like, I know these problems. I understand how to work on them. I understand what's hard about them. Um, and so, you know, there was a lot of innovation then, a lot of thinking about how to make contacts better. But this was all, remember when we were on flip phones, right? Motorola yep. star tax and things like that. And so like contacts just wasn't necessarily as useful or as big a thing, but they have a lot of really good ideas. Then it kind of goes through the winter of contacts where there's not much many companies working on it. There's not a lot of innovation. Then Microsoft comes and starts to try and do the most on contacts. So they start to really work on it inside of Outlook. And you start to see a lot of innovations in contacts and people who have Outlook start to get better and better contacts. And then um, the iPhone, you know, basically Apple adopts the standard that Microsoft has developed in terms of the key card or the ECF, and that at least standardizes context. So, because up until then it wasn't even possible between like Google, Apple, Microsoft to actually like transport contacts easily and 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 um, and merge them in and have them where you wanted them. And so, you know, and then then not a lot happened after that. So at first you'd be like, wait, usually when there's a big standardization event like that. And, a major player adopts it, it unlocks a whole bu bunch of startups, innovation, new thinking, and it gets standardized, and then there's not a lot that happens. There were some things like no. Bump. Bump was, a, Bump was a great company, that, but oh, yeah. Bump, Bump didn't actually try I to organize your contacts. It didn't try to update them. It just made it really easy to share them because you could just bump your contact in the air. But we really feel like it's all of the above, right? One of the reasons contacts were so screwed up is that when you meet a new person, I could I could pull it up here, right? When you meet a new person, you're using the you know the contacts app, right? And you hit the plus in the upper right hand corner, and like this happens, yeah, right? You're like okay, so like now I got like, a bunch of things out. I yeah. probably got like somewhere between fifty and seventy five keystrokes. I got a quick type in with the person's name, their phone number. By the way, in user studies, we ask people when you meet someone new, what do you do? And a whole bunch of people just like hand their phone over, and there's like. You know what to do. Just like put yourself on my phone. <laughs> Some people send themselves an email or text. Some people call themselves and then everyone's busy typing in each other's information. You're just like, wait, like meeting somebody new is, a, is something pretty common that, that happens for most people almost every day, right? And the fact that like getting the contact information from the person you just met is so awkward is one of the reasons that we ha that ha the contacts have so many problems. People just quickly jot something down. It's got a typo in it. It's got misspellings in it. Um, it's got partial information. And so you got to be kind of, in our view, make sharing better. Well, you also have great organizational tools and you know something that can really synthesize a lot of information from different sources. And email is a key and obvious source that's part of it, which a lot of the contact solutions to date haven't tapped into. 
And you, and then a lot of people use like LinkedIn almost as their contact manager. Yeah. Now, of course, my mom's not on LinkedIn, so it doesn't work for everybody uh, that's out there. But they'll use they'll, they might do that search, and maybe you can't do the search for people that ski, but they might. Okay, who do I know in Minnesota that it looks like this or something? Because I'm going there for a day. Yeah, totally. And so, I mean, it's there, but it's it's you know it's, the fact that you have to go to one specific platform or cut to your point, yeah. like you're searching just a fraction of it, right? The fact that your contacts are so fragmented and is frustrating in and of itself. And so we're just trying to bring that together. And we do we actually go and seek, seek out LinkedIn's because most people don't have LinkedIn's in their contacts. But we're like, if we can find your LinkedIn, if we can find your Twitter, right? We go ahead and just put that all there. And the fact that it just seamlessly ends up on your contact card. Um, is, you know, is important. So, you no, know, actually, well, it's funny because you're, you're so prolific, but, um, you know, this is what you look like in my phone now, right? Like I can tell you're a safe graph. I don't know if you can see all that, <laughs> right? You can see all of the email addresses you bailed me from, right? You know, including some, Probably some think old are ones. Some yeah. that we think, but we've marked them as obsolete, right? Yeah. I've got your yeah. addresses. Sorry, you might want to like blur that on their screen. We'll blur that out. Your birthday. So, yeah. Your you birthday. Don't see that, yeah. But by the way, like, I mean, the nice thing is like, I didn't sit here and type in your birthday and type in your Facebook right. and your messenger handle and all of these different things. Like, we just pulled that all out of my email and populated it into my contacts, right? So um, like that we think that the right contact solution was someone like that, but yeah, you might have to do some fancy editing on that part. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Well, <laughs> note to the editor. Let's, let's uh, make sure my, my home address is in there, but everything else, whatever. Um, yeah. That now, now um, you know, you, you, um, you, when, when you're, when you're Yahoo CEO and even kind of like before and after Yahoo CEO, you've been under like intense media scrutiny. Like, how do you deal with that? Well, I got some advice early when I was at Google, um, which I was really grateful for, which was don't read it. <laughs> um, and so you don't, you don't read the comments. I, don't, or... don't read it. And, and, and I was like, why? And they're like, because it can, it can change your view of the work that you're doing. Basically, you know, if you see someone say like, wow, what a genius move, even if it's wrong, it's going to make you more likely to not want to back off of it. Or if they yep. criticize it, and you're just like, but it I, becomes I think more I, about but your I, identity. But I think I think I got it exactly right. But it's being criticized, it makes you doubt it more and more likely to revisit it or back off of that decision. And they were like, and what, you know, with all respect to journalists, because they do incredible work that's so important, especially in a democracy like ours, like they don't have the information inside a company or coming from the users inside a product line, and so, you know. They have a very they have a partial picture of what's driving a change or a policy change or a new product feature. And it might look really silly at first, even if it's the right thing, or it might look really genius and it's not it's not, it doesn't make any sense at all. And you've got a much more complete picture. So what you've got to do is you've got to use the information that's available to you, make the best as you can, and not have this secondary voice that has partial information influencing you. Right. So I I don't read it. I do, I am on Twitter, so I do see headlines and then I guess a couple of different philosophies I've adopted over time. One is if something becomes big enough and that you kind of need to know, like, wait, what, what are they saying? You know, someone someone else will tell you, right? Like I have to yeah. say the the whole work from home thing, because you know, early at my time at Yahoo, one of the lot things a long time Yahoo's that I met with um said was they were like, you know, this work from home stuff is killing us because it's not formal work from home. People can just work from home and they feel like it. And yeah. we're all here and we're looking hard and we have to stop and, and catch people up. And, you know, we basically granted formal work from home status to everyone who already had it. But we, what we said is, please stop the informal work from home. The, I don't feel like going to the office today um, stuff. And that really blew up. And like, I was like, there's a Twitter and I was like, I'm not sure exactly what's happening here. I got some emails from some old childhood acquaintances that just didn't make sense to me. I remember like leaning over to my husband because we were at a conference together. I said, like, what's going on with this? And he was like, let me explain. <laughs> I, <laughs> I was like, okay. So, I mean, I feel like, you know, even if you may have taken the wrong stance or the wrong view on something, it always feels better to have that conversation with somebody in a bit more nuanced way than in a way like the, than reading internet trolls, for example. And the other thing is, you know, I also feel that like the media has definitely gotten some of my personality characteristics and some of my motivations wrong. And some things have just been factually incorrect. 
And you have to decide, you're, are you going to spend all of your time running around trying to correct that? Or, you know, what what really matters? And my view has just been like, the people who actually know, who are like physically in my life and see me and know me and interact with me, you know, their, their opinion of me and my values and what I'm doing and what motivates me is what matters most to me. And it's nice if that gets out accurately, but if it gets out inaccurately and I'm judged, un, you know, un, you know, judged for it, you know, you just have to decide whether or not that that matters to you is where you want to spend your time. One of the things that I've learned from like journalists is that they really write two stories about people. Like story one is this is the best person ever, and story two is this is the worst person ever, and it rarely are either story true, right? Right. It's the usually truth is always somewhere are, in between. Yeah. yeah. And so they love those two stories. I guess those that's what probably what readers like is those stories. But they're it's, it's rare that oh, like this is a cool, it's an interesting thing. It's something something. It's it's rare to have like the nuance, uh, the the actual appropriate uh, reporting. You know, I remember I'm not an expert in films, but I do think I read I read different different analyses that have shown that like over time, film characters have gotten more one dimensional. They're either the hero or the villain. Where like if you start to watch old movies, like sometimes they're really interesting, and you're like, oh, because like <laughs> you know, like she can be very sweet and also like very conniving and interesting. Right? Like they they got like they're really very multifaceted yep. characters. I remember seeing that analysis of like different roles, especially for women where they're like now no you're either you know the mom like the hard driven car- corporate person or whatever it is in 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 you know tv and 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 movies but not really in, in uh, synthesizing and integrating all the different pieces and components now you mentioned earlier you're kind of famous for being a hard worker where do you how do you think about like uh, motivating other folks to work or how do you how do you think about like or has any of your thoughts evolved over the years on that um no i mean i think that you know i try to not ask for other people what i wouldn't ask of myself so that's one of my 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 rules where so i'm just like okay like if you know i wouldn't you know do something or spend my time on something then i shouldn't ask other people to do it and i think that's generally a good standard and and principle and practice and to that end, sometimes I'll be like, well, wait, but I would work harder or do more than than some of the people that I work with. And like, how do you reconcile that? Um, but I find that if you, you know, it, it it's not about how much you work. It's really about productivity because, you know, back to the yep. APM program, I had one of my best APMs ever um, was just like 55 hours a week. Like, I'm going to be here. I'm going to be like productive and prolific and hard charging and like you know every night at 7 p.m like i walk out and i like do not work weekends and he was terrific right he was he it was an incredible agreement and he and by the way he got more done in those hours than the people yeah. who were there like 80 hours a week right <laughs> and, um and you know it, it's really about how do you manage yourself and and so i just said like i talked i've talked sometimes about how do you manage your rhythm how do you avoid, you know, feeling out burned out or resentful yourself? Because I think if you can manage that, um, you can work arbitrarily hard for arbitrarily long periods of time, as long as you're getting what you need. And for some people, that's eight hours of sleep a night, three, you know, balance meals a day, time with their kids, et cetera. Different stages of life that that's, you know, in different, different t- times and places. Like for me, when I was young and single, I like to every four months, just go and take a whole week off of work and go somewhere new in the world I had never been. Cause I got all kinds of new ideas and it really energized me and made me realize like, okay, I can take, I can step away for a week and things yep. don't break and it's, and with everything keeps going. And I feel like, you know, it gave me, it gave me good insights and reassurances. Um, you know, now as a mom, like just all of the kids and, and that time. And I, I can see that side of it too. And so, what you need to to really fuel your inspiration and motivation um, is, I think, the most important part to to castle, as they say. Well, one of the things I have found is that some people need to work eighty hours to get good forty hours of work, and some people could do forty and forty. Uh, and maybe you know, it's, there's some probably correlation with experience, but there there's other you know, other people get distracted types of things as well. And when you find that, you you mentioned that person who could, you know, that, that 55 that they put in was actually probably a real 55 of core, hardcore, or, like yeah, focused working. Yeah. Yeah. 
the, that then you know that's that that can be pretty amazing so it's it, it, it's hard to it's hard to do an apples to apples comparison but i find that the people who really hit that maximal productivity one they're in jobs that really speak to them right where there speaks to their talents it speaks to what they want to be doing but they also really know themselves they know what you know is going to really drive them and make them want to work that hard and so that's why I started I started calling it your rhythm where I would ask people if I was worried about them and how hard they were working and where they were done because you know Google was an incredibly intense place Yahoo as we tried to do these big transformations was a very intense place and when I get worried about people I'd ask them like you know what, what is it that you need to to really keep yourself you know fueled and and um and if they know themselves, they have really good answers. So I had Katie, who was a soccer mom, and her she was working, I think, on Google Finance, and her team was in Bangalore. And so she was on the phone. She had three kids under the age of five, and she was on the phone every night at one in the morning with her team. And I was like, I'm really worried. I don't understand how you're going to keep this up. Like, I'm really worried about you. And and she was like, you know, don't worry about me. She's like, I love the team, and I don't mind the one a.m. calls. Like, I'm I'm in with them, and She's like, but I hate missing the soccer game. And I hate being the mom who walks in late to the recital. So what I could uh -huh. really use your help with is when I tell you, like, I've got to be out of here at four o'clock. Like, you'll, you know, she's like, a lot of times, not you, but other colleagues will reach and be like, can you just stay for five more minutes? Can we just finish this discussion for 10 more minutes? And she's, and I was like, okay, I've got it. Like from now on, if you tell me you've got to go, like, and somebody says, hey, can't you just stay? I'm gonna say, no, no, she's gotta go. She's like, if you can help me get to the soccer games and the music recitals on time, I can do all the 1 a.m. calls you want. <laughs> and I was like, okay, that sounds, that sounds a little crazy to me, but okay. And she really knew herself and she stuck to that. So if you know what matters to you and what can motivate you, um, and you really know yourself, I think that's really how to maximize productivity. All right. Now, a couple of personal questions. It's been really fun. You're from Wisconsin. I love Wisconsin. I got married there. I, it's, I think it's one of the more underrated states. When I got married there, I think more than half the guests had never even been to Wisconsin. Yeah, uh, there's a lot. I mean, why would you go unless you're white right for work or you're up there? Yeah. Well, it, it is so beautiful. But one of my one of my observations of going there is just people are just so happy. I don't know if you you've seen that as well. Like, And if so, why, why do you think people in Wisconsin are so happy? I think it's a, I mean, I will say, I think it's a great, it's a great state. It's a great place. It was a great place to grow up. It's still a great place to go back to. My kids, we, they, they, they can't wait to get to the lake in Wisconsin this summer. Um, and uh, my parents will have a place there. And, you know, I think that it's, it's a great overall environment. Like I miss the seasons. I love California, but I miss the seasons and snow and fall and spring and all of that. Um, and, you know, I think that, you know, it's a balance of, People are really polite. They're nice. I mean, if anything, yep. they're, they're, they're almost nice. too. Yeah. They're, 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 they're almost too polite. But I mean, you're just like, you know, life is too short for people who aren't nice. And there's a lot of nice people in Wisconsin who are very polite. And they're also really hardworking. And they find a lot of of meaning in, in working hard and you know, building community and supporting each other. And so I think, you know, Wisconsin's got a lot going for it in those dimensions. And I think that's one of the things that pees happiness. I think when people when feel think of your... purpose and they feel involved with their community and they like the people around them, that leads to a lot of happiness. When you think of yourself, do you think of yourself more as an insider or an outsider? Because when I think, I think you could be kind of somewhat of both. An insider or outsider of Wisconsin? No, no, no. Just in general, mm -hmm. like an insider oh. or an outsider. Yeah. Um, I, I feel more, I feel like more of an insider. I think that's probably because I, I am introverted in my nature and I like... Like I like small groups. I, I like big groups too, but I like being I like being on the inside. You know, when I left Yahoo, I thought a lot about did I want to go and be an investor or did I want to go and be an entrepreneur? And I have to say the debate wasn't long. Like I have some interest in investing and I do some investing on the side as an angel. But I was like, I like to be a part of something. Right? Like being inside of, of Google from the very early days and watching it, it grow, right? Being part of the trying to transform. Yahoo. I like I like being an operator. I like being in, in inside of something that's building. And it, I like to be really focused on, I like my breath to come from, you know, what's the marketing look like? What does the product look like? What does the technology look like? 
all of those different spheres as opposed to, for example, multiplexing over lots of different companies. Oh, cool. All right. Well, last question we ask all of our guests, what conventional wisdom or advice do you think is generally bad advice? I think that the common piece of advice that I think is wrong is don't rush to judgment. Because I think that a lot of times when you have a snap judgment, this is a great product idea. This isn't going to work at all. Um, you might say to yourself, gosh, I should, I should give it more time. Um, but I think uh, you actually have more informed intuition than you realize. So it feels like just a snap judgment is actually colored from a whole world of experiences. And sometimes if a thought occurs to you is for a reason. And so it doesn't necessarily mean you should just like every time there's that that snap judgment or that first impression that you go with it. But I think sometimes people talk themselves out of that first impression um, to their detriment. And how do you like, if you think of like, the, like what in some ways it's like how much you should trust your gut. Totally. Um, yeah. And I, I, you know, I found personally that my gut tends to be good when it tells me not to do something, but when it tells me to do something, it's not the best. Um, like, how do you know when to trust it or when to not trust it? It, uh, it's interesting. Um, one of the the people that I talked to, and I thought it was really insightful, uh, but um, John Chambers, long time CEO of Cisco, reached out to me and was a really good um, mentor to me. And at one point, I went to him with a decision I was having a really hard time. And you know, I laid out all the different factors, and he said, "No, I don't know anything about this, um, and I don't know the people involved, and and all that, but." He's like, what I know about myself is, it's like, I'm a pretty decisive person. And if there's ever a decision that I feel really uncomfortable with, and I'm really belaboring in this way, I probably shouldn't do it, right? Like, it, that should probably, <laughs> he's like, something's wrong. Because if I, if he's like, if it was the right thing, I would have just done it already. And so he's like, it's sort of interesting because like, for him, it was, it was this kind of, it was a meta analysis of how he felt about a decision. So there's always like the first level, which is the pros and cons of the decision they're making. But he was like, wait, if I found myself like revisiting it, trying to talk myself into it, right? Like not being able to come to a really definitive conclusion. He's like, that says something in and of itself, regardless of what the decision was and the merits and that and and you know, this merits are. Interesting. I love it. That's so interesting. Uh, this is great. Well, thank you, Marissa Meyer, for joining us on World of Das. I follow you at Marissa Meyer on Twitter. I definitely encourage our listeners to engage with you there. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you so much. <laughs>